that and Facebook might not be working. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to keep saying hello as if it is. Yes. It doesn't seem like it is yet, but. Hello and welcome, everybody. I don't think it's actually working. <laughs> I think we're live on YouTube now. So hello to anybody on YouTube. <laughs> Fabulous. Welcome. All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome so much. So great to see you here. And uh, great to see everybody. This is a live webinar. We have clarinet players from all over the world here watching us today. So great to see you all here. And I know we've got people tuning in from all over the world. So here's what we're going to ask. We have people here on Zoom. We have people on YouTube. We have people on Facebook, all part of our worldwide community. We would love to find out where you're from. So whatever interface you're on, for example, if you are here uh, watching us on Zoom, you can open up your chat box and where you type in, just put it to all attendees and panelists and let us know where you're from. For example, we see Beth from Waterloo, Ontario, and all sorts of people. Marilyn from Delaware. So welcome, welcome. I know we have people from all over the world. Look at that, New Zealand. Welcome, Rebecca. Welcome, Sitsky from the Netherlands. I love seeing how we have people from literally all over the world. So welcome to all of you. We are here to just answer as many clarinet questions as we can in our time together. And... Um, to that end, here's how we're going to manage it. If you have a question, you can type it right into the chat box. And what will help us recognize it is just put a few question marks, question, question, question. And then it'll also help us. We're going to try and answer all the tone questions together and then all the fingering questions. So you can just give us a one word topic like it's about tone. It's about fingering. It's about equipment. It's about bass clarinet. That way we'll group them together and, and it'll be easier when we watch the replay for you to focus in on the area where you most have your question. All right. I'm going to, Josh, why don't you um, introduce yourself to everybody and I'm just going to go over and take a look and make sure Facebook is doing its thing. Yes. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Josh Gu. Uh, I'm a clarinetist. Uh, I'm just finishing up my master's degree studying with Steve Cohen at Northwestern University, uh, which I'm really excited to uh, start diving into the pro professional clarinet world. Um, and I am the founder of Quick Start Clarinet, uh, which is my uh, online company with the goal of helping clarinetists from all over the world succeed at playing the clarinet. That is fabulous. And so, Josh, I know you've got some courses, you have a YouTube channel. So later on in our call here, we'll be giving um, just details on where people can find you if they want to look at more of your resources. Um, and I'm Michelle Anderson of Clarinet Mentors. I have also a YouTube channel with lots of great resources for clarinetists, um, lots, of, lots of courses available for people who want to dive deeper. Um, but really, our purpose today is to share as much knowledge as we can with all of you in the community. So I see lots of questions coming in already. <laughs> um, so, Josh, how about if I read a question and uh, let's just dive in and start answering it. I'm going to sort of look for, let's see what categories we have here. Um, so we have people asking about, here's one that Beth is asking. How to keep the throat tones, the A and the B flat, from sounding gurgly and bubbly? And she says, I'm guessing it's an air production thing. Interesting. Um, yeah, so I think the, the throat tones are uh, notoriously difficult on the clarinet. Um, the, the gurgling is actually interesting. It sounds like um, that could be spit in the tone holes, actually. Um, sometimes, like... In your like a key um there will like spit will build up there and you can just like blow it out or swab it out and that will usually uh fix that problem um but the other thing that i think about with the throat tones is they require a little bit more like focused airstream so uh, i always think about like hitting a bullseye with my air and for the throat tones you have to be like even more focused uh so that they can come out clearly um but the throat tones are really probably one of the greatest challenges on the clarinet so spending a lot of time doing long tones and trying to like dial in how to get a great sound on those and then keeping it i think that's the really the key to figuring out how to make the throat tones sound great yeah i think that's great josh i'm going to add a couple things there um 
the the throat tone A and B flat in particular on clarinet are acoustically not great notes. It's kind of a design flaw in how the instrument is designed. So to some extent, we have to live with that. There are some fingers you can add to those notes. We call them resonator fingers. And it's actually a little different on every single individual clarinet. So to some extent, you need to um, experiment with this a little bit. But I'll give you the short form. And um, at some point here in the chat box, and I'll post a link. And we're going to have a replay of this. So we'll post additional resources there. I have a YouTube video that goes in, into it in detail. But basically, it's usually a combination of adding the third finger on your left hand, maybe the first and third finger on your right, some pinkies. And you just experiment without, with, try different finger combinations. Not sure how well we hear through the computer, but listen to my B flat with nothing and then with some fingers. And even through our devices, you'll probably hear a little improvement in the sound. Is that coming through, Josh? Did you yeah, hear that? Yeah, definitely. Yep. Yeah. So that's called resonator fingers and um, definitely worth experimenting with if you haven't done that. But Great question, Beth, and it shows good ears to, to notice that, yeah, that's definitely the problem spot on most clarinets. Um, all right, next question, kind of related to tone and such, embouchure question from Kim. I've been struggling with focal dystonia in my embouchure since October. What do you know about focal dystonia? It's okay if you don't. It's a hard question. <laughs> um, so I've actually had a few people dealing with that and talking about it. And, and to be frank, I don't understand all the details of it, but I know that it is a challenge with um, having balance embouchure on your face and such. And what I'll say is this for all of us, whether we're dealing with um, a, a, a physical you know, ailment or not, the muscles that we use to play clarinet, we generally don't use them in the way we do for clarinet in other areas of our life. So they need strengthening and they need toning and working just like if we were a tennis player working on our serve and things like that are going to make it more challenging for sure. But what I have found is people who do systematic work on the same kind of things that anyone will do to strengthen these muscles, it does make a difference and it helps. So earlier Josh was saying making long tones part of your routine, which is just kind of usually when you first start playing, just playing long, easy notes, listening to your sound. What I like to have people think about is these corner muscles squeeze into the sides of the mouthpiece. That's where I find most people have very weak muscles. But getting that movement in there really um, adds a nice warmth and sparkle to clarinet tone, and it makes our higher notes much easier to control. Um, the only thing I would add to that is when we shape our lips like that, it's like we're saying, oh, and our tongue likes to go into O oh position. But for, for a more classical clarinet sound, we like our tongue to be high as if we're saying he. So great practice without your clarinet is to shape your lips in O oh, and then try and say he at the same time. He, it's really hard to do <laughs> and it looks silly, but you can do that when you're walking around the house. So even without your clarinet, you can just try shaping that, squeezing it in and just kind of doing what you can to make your muscles more in shape, but it'll help all of us, whether you're dealing with dystonia or anything else. Um, I don't know, Josh, any thoughts for you on embouchure strengthening? Yeah, as far as the focal dystonia itself, that's uh, really, like, really unfortunate and can be really difficult. The only thing that I, like, really know about focal dystonia is from um, Warren Deck, who was the former principal tuba player of the New York Philharmonic, uh, and he taught tuba at um, my undergrad at the University of Denver. Um, so the way that I understand it is it's just like a lack of control in your muscles. Um, so I do think like all of those like embouchure strengthening ideas and, and exercises are like really, really beneficial. And thinking about like a strong top lip and strong corners is, is really imperative to sound good and have a smooth legato. Um, but in the case of focal dystonia specifically, if you aren't able to control those muscles, um, the one suggestion I might have is um, seeing if you can control it more with the air. I find often that air of, is able yes. to cover for uh, an unsteady embouchure a little bit if the air is really, really strong and really steady. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's great. All right, sorry for that extra Josh for a moment. I was just <laughs> my Facebook feed and it all of a sudden blasted out a high volume. They're like 20 seconds behind us there. <laughs> all right. 
Good. So um, we're trying to cluster right now sort of tone and embouchure questions. So Richard has a good one here. He says, positioning of the tongue is very hard to track or sense since a high position interferes with the read itself. Any guidance? Um, that's a really good question, Richard. I, I think that when a clarinet teacher says to you, oh, keep your tongue high in the mouth, it's a little bit abstract because we can't see it when our clarinet's in our mouth. We don't really know exactly what it's doing. So I find there are a couple ways for us to work on that. Um, one is that probably the closest vowel that at least for me and many of my students works is to imagine we're saying he kind of hissing the H sound like a goose that makes even the sides of our tongue come up high. And as goofy as it feels, if you put the clarinet in your mouth, close your embouchure around as if you're playing and try speaking that, it, it puts our tongue into the right position and gets us accustomed to what that feels like. Um, usually when we blow, it'll immediately drop or change, but we're trying to get used to it. But more importantly is when we start to recognize how our sound changes when our tongue moves, we start to get our ideal sound in mind and we start to recognize it by sound. And when we can hear the difference, um, we start to kind of do it automatically. But at first we have to do things like saying he, a really cool exercise, take your high C, thumb and register key, and see what it feels like to have your tongue, this is, this is the x-ray of my tongue here, going he, just move it up and down. And you'd be amazed at how awful you can sound when your tongue is really low. So not to blow out my mic, I'm going to back up and do that. And um, I'm going to keep my x-ray machine on while I do this. Here's my x-ray. So you can hear, I mean, I could, could have probably made it sound a lot worse, but that as my tongue goes down, it changes. So that's a tool you can use to experiment. Um, Josh, curious your thoughts on just how we get comfortable with voicing and knowing what we're doing. Mm -hmm. I think um, a similar thing to that as well, um, where you do it, but instead of on the high C, where that's like sort of a note that you want to make sound good, just do it on just the mouthpiece or just the mouthpiece and the barrel. Um, and you can do the same exercise. And just the mouthpiece and barrel gives you like a little more flexibility so that you can, can get a wider range. Um, and I find that like when you're doing that, you have... A lot of different options for where the pitch should be and if you can get like pretty much the pitch as high as possible that's sort of where we want to be for like the general clarinet stuff um it was interesting in the question you said like having your tongue high gets it in the way of the read um and something that i've noticed from um watching master classes with charles nydick is he sort of uh, conceptualizes the tongue in like sort of, oops, sorry, <laughs> sort of a, this kind of motion. Um, so like the back of the tongue is really high, but then the, the tip of the tongue is dropping so that it's close to the reed and leaves some opening at the, the point of the reed. Um, but it's really the back of the tongue that gets the high tongue position that we always talk about and with like the E. Um, something else that is really helpful with that is thinking of the like German O umlaut, um, which is like the U sound. Um, and that sort of gets a good combination of both of the, the E in the back uh, and also the U for the, the embouchure. And it drops the tip of the tongue down just a little bit. So you have that high arch and then the close tip to the reed without being just high and like in the way of the reed, like you said in the question. <laughs> There's an interesting uh, book. I had, a, I had a guest artist on a, a session like this, which was Dr. Cornell Wallach, who's, um, I don't know if you've seen it, Josh, but he went into a speech lab at a university and had all these sensors put all over his tongue and then played clarinet so they could actually map the position of his tongue. And he has very good diagrams. It's quite fascinating. So when we when we put out the replay, I'll put a link to his stuff. Um, he's got an online version of the book. It's just if you're interested in actually seeing what the tongue does, it's quite fascinating. And he shows the different positions for lots of different kind of articulation. Um, yeah, yeah, but, I did see uh, that. That was a really great, uh, great live stream and, and information. Yeah. Yeah. And it's kind of just for those of you who are interested in what we do on the clarinet. Now, Certainly, if you're playing more klezmer, jazz, folk, we tend to have a lower tongue position um, because it gives us a, a bigger, broader sound. And when we're scooping pitch, it's often 
our tongue moving up and down that's a big factor in that. So it depends what kind of uh, what kind of thing. In fact, that just ties right into a question someone has: is what do you change most when you bend notes, like for klezmer effects? It's combination of tongue being lower, jaw dropping, throat being open, like you're saying ah, that makes the pitch tank. Yeah. Well, go down and, and up. And yeah, so. and that's sort of the the same thing. Like, uh, I get the question a lot. Like, how do you do the like rhapsody in blue glissando? Um, and that's basically like the the big half of that is the same tongue position thing, where you you work with like the high C or the mouthpiece and just working on bending the pitch down as low as you can by dropping your tongue and like opening your throat, uh, and that gives you like the bend up so that you can do a, a smooth gliss and connect like through all the notes. Yeah, it's fun exercise just to work on that. Um, <laughs> this is a really quick question from Nicholas, and it kind of relates to embouchure. He said, I'm getting braces next year where there'll be any problems I might have to face. Um, I've had lots of students have braces, and the place that it seems to have the most immediate impact is if you get them on your bottom teeth because our lip goes over them. And what most people find is just putting braces in your mouth makes them your teeth sore and it makes your lips sore where it goes over, where your lip goes over, there's now something sharper. It takes getting used to. Um, sometimes your orthodontist will give you wax or, or something that helps pad it. But in most cases, after a week or two, your body adjusts to it and they don't even notice and you sound good. And then when you get the braces taken off again, you have to readjust to getting your, your lip back firm in there. And it takes a couple weeks to adjust to not having them. But Lots of student clarinetists go through it and they, they do fine other than that initial adjustment. I don't know, Josh, anything you would add to that? Yeah, I think that's, I've never played with braces. Um, and I don't think I've actually had any students, at least clarinet students, um, who are playing with braces. Um, but I do, I can't imagine because of how firm that this has to be against the teeth. And it is really like the... Um, the jaw and the, the teeth that are sort of engaging in the embouchure that it could be quite uncomfortable having like braces there with how strong this has to be like firm against the jaw. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, having said that it, it just, most people do adjust to it fairly easily. So I, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Nicholas, just be prepared to tell your band teacher that you may have to sit out of class for the first day or two, once you get your braces on until you kind of get used to it. And they're, they'll be well accustomed to that. All right, so still on our tone, and of course we're gonna to get to your other questions as well. I just saw one other one here from Ismail, and my apologies if I'm not pronouncing this well. Tonguing in high notes produce notes that are less elegant, more fragmented, and it produces a lot of water in my mouthpiece. Is there a particular advice? Josh, you wanna start with that one? Yeah, yeah. Um, so the high notes, um, I always think of it as the high notes are like sort of a good test to see if things are going correctly. Um, a lot of times we feel like we need to like tighten up more or raise our tongue more on the high notes to get it to sound good and in tune. Um, but it's actually true that we should be doing that on the low notes as well. And the low notes are just less forgiving or more forgiving. The low notes are more forgiving. The high notes are less forgiving. Um, as for like the particularly tonguing in the high notes, um, the trick to that is that you have to be a little bit lighter with your tongue. So again, on the low notes, it's uh, pretty forgiving because you can move your tongue however, and usually the notes will sound okay at least. But as you get into the higher notes, if you're hitting the reed too hard um, or pushing into the reed before you release your tongue, then you may be having like issues of it responding because the reed has to uh, vibrate like faster and have more energy in those higher notes. So the one other thing with the, the tonguing and the tongue position too is that you have to keep the back of the tongue really high when you go to touch the reed because if the back of the tongue is dropping when you touch the reed, then when you release, there will be at least a moment where you aren't in the proper tongue position to get that note out. Um, so the way that I might practice this to, to improve it is spend a lot of time again playing long tones um, on your higher notes so you're comfortable with the necessary tongue position to make it sound good and then work on just very lightly moving the tongue to the reed while keeping the rest of the tongue position as steady as possible. Yeah, and I just want to add to what Josh was just saying, you know, that exercise of hanging out on one note and moving your tongue in slow motion is great practice. I think 
I totally agree with Josh that high notes, they're not necessarily harder than low notes, but they're more revealing. If there's anything we're not quite doing right, we're going to feel it as challenges in the high register. Um, every clarinetist I've ever met without exception has an, an inborn tendency when we tongue to huff our air and stop our air a little bit, sort of this natural ta, ta, ta. And if we let our air down and, and even stop it, sometimes we stop it completely. Sometimes we're just kind of letting it sag a bit. It's really hard to have the support for those high notes to come out. So we experience that as the high notes feeling delayed and the tone sounding bad. So not only do we want to think about what our tongue is doing, it's really, really important we notice that our breath should just be carrying on. If I'm holding a long note, my air is doing this. If I'm tonguing a bunch of high notes, my air is doing this. Same thing. My tongue just happens to be getting in the way of the airstream and interrupting it, but I'm still blowing nonstop. And that's that's something that causes a lot of people trouble, but they don't realize it. So if you know to watch for that, it can make a difference for sure. Okay, you guys are sending us fantastic questions. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to switch gears a lot here because I'm seeing a lot of questions just about gear and equipment. And maybe that would be an interesting thing for us to move into for a moment, Josh. Um, mm -hmm. Like David says, why are there two barrels in my case? Yeah. Um, so oftentimes clarinets will come with uh, multiple barrels if you're buying them new, especially the um, like higher quality instruments. Although sometimes the uh, really like low quality instruments from Amazon that I've seen also come with two barrels. Um, the reason for this is because there isn't really like a standard tuning system around the world. Um, in America, we do A440 for our pitch. So that means when we play a concert A, uh, which is our long B, it's 440 hertz um, some places in like Japan is 442 and some places in Europe are 438 so that means that the pitch needs to be higher and lower so instead of having to have one barrel and like pulling out or like pushing in um, depending on where that clarinet is going to be played in the world there's multiple different lengths so that you can have one length that's right for the pitch that you want to play at um, and then you can make small adjustments to the intonation from there but that's the main reason why you your clarinet comes with two barrels um, but there's a lot more about different barrels in general a lot of times people will play on different barrels from what their instrument comes with because of either pitch um, for me personally I tend to play quite sharp so I need to get longer barrels than like the standard 66 millimeter um, and also people like the sound of different barrels and the feel of different barrels. So that's why you might have a different brand than whatever is the same brand as your clarinet. Yeah, I agree with that. I also um, need longer barrels than the standard one. And uh, this ties into, I'm going to just sort of combine two questions. Someone's asked a question about mouthpieces too, which I want to get into that for all of us as clarinetists, all of our gear affects our sound. And when I have a student looking to upgrade to new gear, mouthpiece is the first major piece of gear I always have people do, partly because a really high quality mouthpiece is way less expensive than a really high quality clarinet, but it probably makes as much difference. I'd rather play on my really good mouthpiece and a very inexpensive clarinet than my very expensive clarinet and a cheap mouthpiece. So, um, but having said that, the barrel does have quite an impact on our sound quality and how evenly our notes seem to flow from low to high. And there's many people who make great quality barrels now. And, you know, there have been people experimenting with different barrels for years, but it seems like, especially in the last 10 years, different kinds of wood. Um, this is a Bakun Lumiere barrel and Coca Bola wood. You know, I love the tone of it. And uh, anytime you want to try gear, I just say, try it, try different one's out, see what sounds good, what matches your com concept of sound. What works well for me might not work well for you, but it's really fun to experiment with the different barrels that are out there just from a point of view of sound. I have had students with, with good plastic student clarinets who maybe just aren't financially in a position to upgrade to a wooden instrument, but upgrading to a nice wooden barrel really goes a long way to making that plastic clarinet have the warmth of a wooden clarinet. It's surprising how much of an improvement it is. So that's a gear upgrade to consider once you have a good mouthpiece in place. Um, so I'm going to segue to mouthpieces and talk a bit, and then I want to hand it back to you on mouthpieces, Josh. Mm -hmm. um, 
Louise is asking, I want to understand open mouth pieces versus closed mouth pieces. So there are lots of good quality mouth pieces out there. And I find more than any other piece of gear on clarinet, it's really variable what works for each person. So I would never say this is the best mouthpiece in the world because maybe it is for me, but for no one else on the world, you know, so we all have different size, shape, mouth, and it's really awesome. If you have an opportunity to try a few different mouthpieces, you can tell pretty quickly what responds well to you and what gives you better tone. But if you have the basic kind of plastic beginner one that came with it, it can make a huge difference to how easily you play. So I highly recommend it. Um, there are different ways they're cut inside and out, but the openness refers to when we turn it sideways, we see space between the tip of the reed and the mouthpiece. It's how much space there is. Those more open ones, more closed ones. There's also where does the reed touch the mouthpiece on mine? It's about here. That's our facing, how long the facing is. In, in altering that, affects the sound um, in, in altering just one of them will make it feel more um, free blowing or more resistant. And we want a certain amount of resistance and we also want it to feel like the tone's coming up. Some of that's personal preference. Um, many of you who are regulars in the clarinet mentors community know that I've been well playing almost exclusively recently on the Legere European cut. It took me a lot of getting used to. They work better on a slightly more closed mouthpiece. Um, because the plastic does not bend as easily as, as a cane reed, if your mouthpiece is too open, you're going to find it really hard to control, especially high notes on a synthetic reed. So that's one case where that openness makes a big difference depending on the reeds you're using. Um, but yeah, Josh, why don't you give us some mouthpiece wisdom? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's actually really fascinating. Um, and something that you said about how not everybody's going to play on the same mouthpiece and setup and not everything's going to feel the the same um actually my teacher steve cohen um he plays uh exclusively on the legers um as well um but he actually plays on a very open mouthpiece um and that's just what works for him so it's it's really that just goes to show like how up to the individual it is um and it's depends a lot because everybody has different like mouth uh anatomy so it's gonna change a lot from person to person uh the one other thing with the open versus closed tip thing uh is that's actually a lot more what has to do with the strength of reeds that you should be using um a closed tip mouthpiece is going to need a stronger reed to hold up to vibrate in the smaller distance whereas an open tip uh, will need a softer reed so that you have more flexibility to control it um and I think it's a really common misconception of beginners, uh, especially younger beginners, that think that as they get better, they are going to play on like harder and harder reads and that like, oh, I'm like super good because I play on four and a halfs. Um, but that's not necessarily the case at all. And it's very dependent on the, the opening of your mouthpiece. So that's, that's what you have to take more into consideration when you're choosing read strengths and the openness and closeness of your mouthpiece. Yeah, and that raises a good point that if you are able to go into a music store or, or you know, a clarinet convention or something where you can play test a bunch of mouthpieces, it's a good idea to bring in some reeds that you know are a little more resistant and a little softer because some mouthpieces do need a softer reed or a more resistant reed. And to give it a fair try, you want to make sure you have different reeds to be able to test those out on. It's not uncommon to change reed strength if you get a mouthpiece that's cut you know, fairly uh, differently from what you've been accustomed to. Okay, so, um, and Chuck, you had a question on Facebook about the difference between the European cut Legere and the regular signature. I actually don't know. I, I'm sorry, I'm sure Legere has that in detail. It's it's. I think that I believe the European cut's a thicker blank. I'm not positive on that. Um, for me, the European cut sounds way better than the signature. That's true of most professional players that I know, but again, not true for everybody. So, uh, sorry, I don't, I don't know if you know the answer to that, Josh. Or... Yeah, I don't know that either. I do know that the, yeah, the European cut is a little bit like wider and a little bit shorter, also. And I also know that they're like by far more popular, and most everybody who plays on Legere's full time uses the European one. <laughs> Yeah, I think in the classical world, certainly that's that seems to be the read that's really made the difference. Um, 
So related to mouthpiece uh, from Kurt, is it important that a mouthpiece is pitched at 440 for your particular country? You know, Van Doren actually does have some mouthpieces that are aimed at the pitch of your country. Most manufacturers just have a standard side mouthpiece and they let you adjust pitch with your barrel. But um, yeah, I know, I don't know if other companies specifically have it tuned that way, but I know the Van Doren M series is designed for American pitch, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, yeah, they have yeah I think it's the, uh, the 13 series the is, 13. is what makes it at 440. Yeah. And then all the other ones, if it's not a 13 series, then it's at 442, I believe. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Josh. Yeah. And, and then David says, why does some advise against swabbing the mouthpiece? Um, so... David, the, the inside chamber of the mouthpiece is much narrower than the rest of the clarinet. If you have a big, huge clarinet swab, which I kind of recommend, and you run it through the mouthpiece and it's resistant, you end up actually wearing down the sidewalls of the mouthpiece and changing the cut of it. And when I was a brand new clarinetist, I had a wonderful mouthpiece. I inherited a used instrument from someone that had a high quality mouthpiece. And after two years, it started squeaking for no reason. And my teacher said you don't swab your mouthpiece do you I was like, yeah and so i had wrecked it by accident so you can wash your mouthpiece in warm water every now and then you can i sometimes just wrap my finger around the swab and kind of reach in and get the little bits but i don't personally run my full-size swab through it josh what do you do yeah i do swab my mouthpiece um but not like every time i swab my instrument and um I've heard from, it was Brad Bain, uh, who is a mouthpiece maker, uh, he recommends swabbing the mouthpiece, and that's actually uh, when I started doing it, was after I heard him say that, because, again, when I was younger, too, I had a, I got a custom mouthpiece when I was in high school, um, and it played really well, and then I got a new clarinet, actually, it was the primary reason I stopped using it, um, but at some point I did hear that you shouldn't swab your mouthpiece. And I actually looked in it and um, like in this like backside, there were like a bunch of little uh, like dents in it basically, because I was actually like turning my whole clarinet upside down and like dropping the, the uh, swab all the way through. So it was like hitting the back here and, and taking material off of the mouthpiece, which um, isn't good. Um, <laughs> what I have heard and what I do when I swab is I take the mouthpiece off and then I put the swab through this side so that the, the weight does come out of the tip, but it goes through like very slowly, so, so nothing gets hurt. And then you pull it out this way so that you're not pushing against the uh, rails and, and causing those to, to get um, warped or changed. That's nice, that's very, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks to Brad Bain for teaching that <laughs> yes. to all of us. Thank you, Josh. <laughs> all right, um, there's some, what I love about the Worldwide Clarinet community as I'm scanning questions, some of them are already answered. You know, Beth was asking, it's related to braces, to having uneven, uneven bottom teeth and our dental specialists in the group already have lots of answers, but how the orthodontist has bracket guards, a thin piece of clips that will help Nick, but also um, someone else just also says uh, you can get things that cover your bottom teeth. And there are lots of different ways of doing it to help with that. Or even if you are in a situation where maybe you play in a band and you're having a retreat weekend and you guys are suddenly playing five hours a day and you're just not used to that, your uh, teeth can actually start cutting into your bottom lip. It is a good idea to cover your teeth with something. I mean, the super quick short-term crude fix is you just take a little piece of paper and <laughs> fold it over your bottom teeth. And when it's wet, it kind of molds to your teeth and you pull it out when you're done. Even that padding will help. All right. Um, Nora says, how often do you recommend changing your mouthpiece? Josh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that depends a lot on how much you're playing, uh, for one, and just how it feels to play. Um, I often think that like a good time to think about either changing your mouthpiece or getting it like refaced uh, by a professional like mouthpiece repair person um, would be when you like can't seem to find like any reads that work for it. So you try like different brands, different strengths, and just like nothing works. So that might mean that there's more of an issue with your uh, mouthpiece or maybe even your clarinet, but it's always good to start with the mouthpiece. Um, I personally, just over my time of playing, have gotten a new mouthpiece probably every 
two or three years, but that was usually because I was changing, uh, changing models and I was at like a convention or something and tried a bunch of different ones and thought it was easier to play on one over my current one. So then I would switch at that point. I think there's value for all of us at different times to try out things that are out there. You know, the people who make mouthpieces are consistently improving their craft and coming up with better and better models. So even if you have one that you like and sounds good on, it doesn't hurt to try new things just to see what's out there. Um, and it's true that even our, even if we take great care of our mouthpieces, sometimes they do warp and change and they need to be either maintained or, or replaced after a certain amount of time, you know, luckily we can often get the same facing that we had if our mouthpiece has just uh, been wrecked over time, which sometimes happens. Um, someone in here is saying you can use hydrogen peroxide to clean your mouthpiece. Just, just a word of caution, most mouthpiece blanks have latex in them and hydrogen peroxide does degrade latex. So um, I would use that sparingly and fleetingly and wash it off, but it's a great way to clean things and uh, and a lot of people I know put cane reeds or even plastic reeds in hydrogen peroxide or Listerine to kind of sterilize it. Um, but yeah, I, I would not let it soak for a long time in hydrogen peroxide because I would be worried about destroying it accidentally. It's never good. Yeah, I think like typically um, the mouthpieces aren't super reactive to to most like chemical things. Um, so if it's just like a, a short like dip in hydrogen peroxide to get the, the stuff off, then yeah, that's good. But really soaking it in anything for a long time isn't really necessary. And yeah, it can increase the chances of there being uh, damage from that. Yeah. yeah, nothing wrong with cleaning them out from time to time. Mm -hmm. um, Jean says, I get squeaking quite often. Is this biting on the reed? Uh, what bit of the reed am I biting on? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so I'm going to jump in there. I think that most people bite too much on the clarinet, and it causes us more problems than we realize. And what I mean by that is a couple of things. Well, basically, I mean, we have too much pressure this way on the reed and not enough this way. So in general, rounding our corners not only helps our sound, it helps us get over that. Now, we need a certain amount of pressure on the reed because if I loosen my mouth all the way, I would just have air hissing through the clarinet. But most of us have too much. And a really common um, mistake, I, I guess I'll call it a mistake people make, is that as we go higher, we start to tighten because we like the feeling of control it gives us. And so biting is a bad habit that has some benefits. Biting a little bit can actually make it feel easier to control those high notes so they feel more likely to come out. And there's kind of a safety net in biting. The downside is it restricts our tone a little bit, like my voice is being restricted right now. And it makes it very hard to play the full range of dynamics that we should. When we take that support away, you know, if we really round our corners and open up that biting, we usually sound worse at first. All of a sudden the note's less supported but we replace it with air support. And once we get our air really working, it just totally opens up our high notes. So back to your question, Gene, a classic sign that we might be biting is little chirps at the beginning of a note. Um, a lot of people when they tongue don't realize their jaws moving when they tongue, ta, 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 and they might be biting that way. For many of us, when we hit a hard piece in the music, I'm playing along, do, 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 uh-oh. There's that hard part. We tense up and you show your shoulders. You see your fingers start smashing. Our embouchure tightens up. It's a natural reaction to a challenge. We tense up. And if you hear a squeak, usually, usually it's that you're biting. If you're really new to the clarinet, it might be your fingers not touching down. It can also be, if you're squeaking a lot, a reed that you're starting to get too soft on will squeak more often, but it's usually that. So, um, it actually is our jaw being too tight on the reed. I don't think it matters what part of the reed, it's too much jaw pressure. And um, it's very easy to create that by just, here's a normal embouchure. Here's me trying hard. I squeak right away. Um, so really important to check in. I wanna give you a tool for anyone watching that's my best way to test if you're biting. It's a fingering. Thumb register key, first two fingers. Leave your third finger up, add your next two fingers. This is a really awful fingering for high G sharp. I've only really used it as a high G sharp maybe twice. 
It's super reactable and it's an awesome tool to see if your air and embouchure are working well. If you're squeaking, you'll very, if you're squeaking at all, it's a sign you're biting. It'll squeak really easily. We want it to just. So if you have your clarinets together where you are, you can even just try it right now. Um, if you're not biting, the other thing this note likes to do is this. You might recognize that sound from when you're working on high notes. It's like an undertone. It means our air is not fast enough. So when we take away the biting, we have to replace it with air support. If you can get that fingering sounding good, you know you're on the right track. Sorry, that's a long answer, but I'm kind of passionate about getting rid of biting. So Josh, can I throw that back to you, your comments? Yeah, yeah. I think that that was all really great. And I actually remember uh, when I first saw that video where you explained that like G sharp fingering, uh, that was, yeah, really has been useful in my playing too. Um, and I think the the thing that was interesting about the question too is you're asking like where you're biting if it's too much um on the top maybe um and i just want to address that because i actually think that you almost can't put too much top lip pressure um it's not necessarily like you're pushing down with your teeth or anything uh into the mouthpiece but it's really engaging this top lip and like bringing that down to the mouthpiece so that that's really strong um another way that you can kind of think about it is bringing like the clarinet up so it's really anchored against your teeth um and your your lips down it, the clarinet's up and that gives you like a really strong and secure anchor for for the the clarinet to be um and actually if you do that it pulls the reed away from your bottom lip so that eliminates the biting of your your bottom lip um which is what causes the squeaks and the the bad stuff um i i agree that biting is is a huge issue um because when you think about about it like the goal of making a sound and the way to make a good sound is to maximize the vibrations of the reed um, so no matter how good your air is if the embouchure is too tight and it's like squeezing off the reed or the opposite if it's too like squishy and just dampening all the vibrations of the reed then you're never going to have like a clear rich sound um, so uh, yeah I think all of these like exercises to avoid biting and anything that you can think about to like open up get the corners in and the top lip down so that the pressure is off of the reed and you just have like a good like firm pillow for the reed to vibrate against there the better for the the quality of the sound yeah awesome all right i've been just scanning through questions um and we've covered lots there was one there's someone who's asking is what we're seeing does it apply to bass clarinet great question i have my bass out just in case we had a good bass question 80% of what we do on little clarinet, probably more applies to bass clarinet. So much of what we're seeing definitely applies, you know, because bass clarinet's a bigger mouthpiece, we're a little more open and our, our tongue probably sits a little bit lower for good bass clarinet sound. So there are some differences, but pretty well, the way we approach and learn it is almost exactly the same way. So if, if there's something where I, in my mind, think, oh, yeah, except on bass clarinet, I do it differently. I'll mention that. But most of what we're saying applies really well to bass clarinet today. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that, too. Um, the the main difference for me with bass clarinet is it's a little bit bigger instrument. So everything just has to be, like, a little bit bigger. The embouchure opening's a little bit more. The air is, like, a little bit wider airstream. It should still be, like, a strong, well-supported airstream. But sort of instead of on clarinet, you get the like super uh, small airstream on bass clarinet, it's just a little bit bigger, but still fast, fast moving air. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. Oh, the one thing, the other thing I was gonna say is that whenever you're learning really any instrument, whether that's clarinet or bass clarinet or anything else, really the key isn't so much to be thinking about the small technical things that you're doing, but more just thinking about the sound that you wanna get. So when you're practicing the bass clarinet and doing your long tones and other warm-ups, um, be thinking about the, the sound that you're aiming for and use that time to experiment with what you have to do so that your, your body can memorize how to make that good sound. Yeah. In fact, um, Marion had written us a question about bass clarinet. She's in Australia, couldn't watch us live. And um, I want to answer that, but also show how this might relate to the little clarinet too, even though this is an exercise I use almost exclusively on bass clarinet. You know, Josh was talking a lot about how you almost can't have too much of your top lip pushing down. That's a really nice support for it. Um, as an exercise, 
practicing with double lip embouchure where your top lip goes over your top teeth is, is a great exercise. Now, some of you may play that way full time. There's nothing wrong with that. That's a standard accepted embouchure practice to play double lip. In fact, I think more, I think that's getting more fashionable than rather than less. I think more people are switching to double lip. Personally, I just, I'm used to my teeth being on the mouthpiece, but Marion had written notes on bass clarinet and, you know, meaning even just hygiene above. Sometimes it's hard to get the feel for the air on those. And this is an exercise that doesn't sound very good, but it's a training exercise and it really helps us with our air. So I'll show it to you, but you can do variations of it on the little clarinet too. What we do is we, we go double lip. We put both of our lips over. On the bass clarinet, we deliberately put even more mouthpiece in our mouth than usual. Most people don't put enough mouthpiece in, but I'm going to go to an extreme. And we have our jaw really open, so it's very loose, and we blow as hard as we can. And the tone, not so good. Well, so this is fun. I get to demonstrate bass clarinet not sounding great. <laughs> so I'm going double lip. <laughs> So what I got there was a bunch of squeaky squawky sounds, uh, but it having the double lip really um, forces me to be nice and round. And on bass clarinet, you have to blow really hard to do what I just did with really nice supported fast airstream. And that can um, really help us then if we put our go back to normal embouchure, it helps those high notes just to pop out. And anyone I know who's tried this finds it to be really effective. Um, on soprano clarinet, just let me secure this. It's not so much that we need to do that for high notes, but just, just playing some slow notes with that will be a good way to counter our biting. It's, it really hurts to bite when you play double lip embouchure. So just playing a couple long tones with double lip will also help cure you of too much biting. The other thing, uh, like with Marion's question about the high notes on the bass clarinet, uh, when I very first started playing bass clarinet, um, I realized that like when you're looking at like that G, for example, the one that's just on the top of the staff, um, and bass clarinet music, at least written in treble clef, it's written as that G on top of the staff. And as somebody who's like played clarinet a lot more, you're you're probably like expecting, like you, you see that and you know like what that feels like, but you have to remember the bass clarinet sounding an octave below that. So instead of thinking about like aiming for that high G, you're actually playing more like an open G. So that's totally like a different voicing and if you see that G and you like aim for the the G in the octave of the the B flat clarinet then you're gonna like end up squeaking every time because that's like a higher a way higher note on the bass clarinet that you're sort of aiming for the one other thing too with high notes on the bass clarinet that um, I'm not sure that Marianne was specifically talking about these high of notes but when you get to like the D um, to E instead of using like the normal like bass clarinet uh, altissimo fingerings if you actually do like a G overblown to the D and then G sharp is the D sharp and then A is the E those are like much much more reliable for those notes and sound way better on the bass clarinet uh, rather than on the clarinet you would never want to use those fingerings unless it was like a really tricky alternate fingering situation um, but on the bass clarinet those are actually better fingerings than like the standard uh, altissimo fingerings. Yeah, it's true. They work. They work really, really well. And even sometimes on E flat clarinet, I find some of those overtones can be nice. They work better than, not necessarily than the standard fingering, but they work better than they seem to on our regular B flat clarinet. Um, we have a lot of questions. Kind of, I'm going to clump them because a few of you have asked questions related to just practice routines, like how we get motivated what percentage of our practice routine should be what um josh what, what do you think on that topic yeah so what i suggest um as far as like percentage of of practice routines i sort of group everything about playing into either like playing the clarinet or playing music um, and that's actually how I've sort of sorted out the uh, quick start clarinet courses too I have like a course on how to play the clarinet and a course on how to play music um, so I separate my practicing into that as well so I'll spend like maybe 
the first third, which is actually something that I learned from a clarinet mentor's YouTube video was to do like a third on, on fundamentals. Um, so like the first third or maybe even half, if you're like more of a beginner and need to invest more time into like how to play the clarinet, I'll spend that doing like warm up exercises, long tones to focus on like the air and the embouchure and the sound, uh, scales to get the fingers moving and keeping a good sound. And then articulation exercises to keep the good sound while you're moving your tongue. Um, um, and then the second half is more about like learning the music itself. Um, so oftentimes the, the music will be related to the clarinet playing, but it's really separate. If you have like a bunch of like staccato notes, you have to make those notes sound short. And of course that incorporates stuff about like the articulation and the how to play clarinet. But when you're learning the music, you're focusing on like how to actually do that in the music. So we spend this time working on the fundamentals to, to figure out how to play. And then we have to implement that playing in the actual music itself. As far as mindset, this actually ties into another question too. Somebody was asking, um, like, how do you learn the sharp and flat notes and how do you get that into the lizard brain? Which again is another uh, video that I really like from the, the clarinet mentors about like this lizard brain idea. And the where I learned it too was from the book, The Talent Code. Um, which is a study of all these like really successful, mostly like sports uh, places, like the Brazilian soccer team. Um, and it shows how they do these like really in-depth uh, practices um, and things that are like really mindful. And that actually trains the brain faster and better and gets our like lizard brain to, to know what we're supposed to do better. Um, and the main thing that I've gotten from reading that book is that our brains get good at doing whatever we're doing. Um, so we have to practice, but we have to practice perfectly also. It's not practice makes perfect, but practice makes permanent. So whatever we're doing, we're gonna get good at doing it. So as far as the uh, flats and sharps, as in the question, um, I think the best way to do that is to just practice the chromatic scale really mindfully because that gets every single sharp and every single flat in it um, at some point, especially if you're doing a full range one. And unfortunately for fingerings, there's not really any good like trick to learn the fingerings other than just like doing it a lot. So I would do just like chromatic scale, nice and slow, being really thoughtful about where you're going and making sure that you're, you're getting it as perfect as possible every single time. And then eventually that'll start to like get into your lizard brain because you get good at doing whatever you're doing. Yeah, it's a great answer. Um, I, I love what Josh said about, you know, practice makes permanent. I think it's important for us to be really mindful that we are practicing our bad habits all the time, unless we recognize them and we're doing something to practice uh, better habits to replace that, you know, and that's where having having um, someone give you pointers, whether it's an online course, a teacher you can go to, whatever it is, it's nice to know what those are. But also, you know, I see a lot of people, they pick up their clarinet. It's kind of like a secret test I have if someone comes to me for less, and I always watch what the first thing they do is, and often they'll just go, <laughs> okay, I'm ready to play. <laughs> They've done this kind of mindless you know, whatever, they're, they're giving themselves permission not to play mindfully. So I think the very first things you do should be very consciously to develop a good habit that you want to work on. If it's a long tone, maybe you're focusing on air, but you could just be doing really slow long tone where you're saying today, I'm going to just start trying to get my fingers in a more round shape and not moving around so much. So I'm going to play a scale really slowly and mindfully watch my fingers. And so I believe if we spend a week or two being really mindful on one topic. It doesn't have to be for hours. It can be for a couple minutes, but we're really focused on it. It starts to send the message to our unconscious brain. This is a habit I'd like to incorporate more often. And there's, you know, there's lots of good habits and, you know, there's keeping our fingers closer to the holes, keeping them arched, keeping them relaxed, not biting, having a good embouchure, having strong air. I mean, there's probably 20 good habits that if we all mastered 80% of our problems would just disappear because our bad habits allow, you know, notes to feel hard and allow us to squeak and I allow our tone to be bad and good habits make it easier to play. Um, and I also agree with sort of dividing our time up a bit, starting with fundamentals, then going into other stuff. The idea of finger patterns, um, we just have to do it. But I think there are some ways to practice that fast track our, our ability to memorize those patterns with finger patterns. 
I highly recommend playing them in different rhythms, alternate rhythms. So even if I was doing a chromatic scale, you can do it in long short, da ba di ba di ba di ba da, and then change it to short long, da ba di ba di ba. For me, maybe it's just me. I have a short attention span. I'm not someone who can sit and play one measure 10 times in a row the same way without starting to drift and maybe going into bad habits. But if I'm kind of changing the rhythm, it's just enough variety to keep me engaged and mindful. And by the time I've played it in three or four different rhythms and I go back to what's written, it often comes together much more easily. So there are some, um, some shortcuts, you, you know, I think to help us learn faster, but ultimately it comes down to, we want, Rhythm patterns to go on autopilot in our brain, and that's learning how to clap and count rhythm. We want finger patterns on autopilot. What Josh said about the difference between a high G and clarinet and on bass clarinet, I think that's true for every single note on any clarinet we play, that there's an optimum embouchure and air that makes it work well, and we kind of want to memorize what that feels like. So when we're doing a big leap, our body eventually automatically adjusts, but at first we have to learn, oh, that leap, how do we make it sound good? So there's a certain amount of, as the jazzers say, woodshedding, which means just get in the practice room and try those patterns. But the good news is once we get these good habits going, it makes it so much easier and you can have so much more fun just with the music. Yeah. What is lizard brain? Yeah, it's goofy. I have a video where I'm wearing a big lizard hat. It's my expression for the autopilot part of our brain where we've programmed something. Lizard brain is neutral. It's not good or bad. It's what we've worked on. And so it's, um, it's the part of our brain that lets us walk without thinking, I have to bend my knee here and my hip here and shift my shoulder here. It's that we've done a physical action enough, it takes it over on autopilot. And it's what serves us with finger patterns, embouchure patterns, everything like that. If you ever are playing a piece of music and you make a mistake and you say, I don't know why I always play that F sharp. If you ever hear yourself saying, I don't know why I always, it's because you programmed it in lizard brain. It's just, and you need to reprogram that mistake because it's likely to happen again, even if conscious brain is going F natural, F natural. Yeah. Yeah. The, the lizard brain thing is something that I'm like really uh, interested in and think a lot about. Um, and that's sort of the idea of like muscle memory in general, or how I say is like your brain gets good at doing whatever it's doing. Um, so again, with like, once you've programmed like the f sharp instead of f natural your brain is used to like firing that like neural network when you get there and it just automatically like goes to f sharp so in order to like change it back it takes a lot of energy and like concentration to be like no i don't want to go this way i want to go this way um so you have to like really put in effort to like change that over and that's why um the the slogan for for quick start clarinet is learn to play right now um because it's really important to play properly like from the beginning because that makes it so much easier to just like do it right from the start and be like on that right channel rather than building up time getting good at going this way and doing like the f sharp and then realizing oh no i have to be doing an f natural or i need to not be biting with my embouchure or i need to use more air support or keep my fingers arched all of those different things that are good habits and again we can't be thinking of those like 20 or like 20 million different things that we have to do to play consciously while we're playing. And that's why we have to do the warm ups um, to train our lizard brain and get good at doing that by muscle memory and on autopilot. Yeah. And it may seem frustrating sometimes that, you know, I often recommend to students pick one main focus for the week. You know, this week I'm doing tonguing exercises and, and it's not that I'm not thinking about my tone or my fingers, but maybe I'm really trying to focus on that for the week. But realize that in a year of 52 weeks, that's a lot of good habits I've improved and, you know, be patient that we can, yeah, we can do a lot over the course of a year. But um, we want to make sure we're really focusing on the habits that most affect us and make the most difference. Um, all right. I see lots of questions related to reads. So why don't we just do some read talk? Julie says, I feel it's more difficult to get the high tones with a less strong read, but the stronger read would be too hard. How can I do it better? Hmm. Any thoughts on that, Josh? I have some, but I'm just curious. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll let you go ahead and take that one first. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, earlier Josh was saying, you know, there kind of gets to be the status thing often with kids like, I play on a five, you know, I must be great. But really, it's different for all of us. Um, that uh, generally speaking, 
when we first start, we want to read that doesn't take a lot of resistance because we're just learning how to blow and we want it to feel easy to play. As our embouchure improves and we start to play with faster air, which I really believe is important to sound good on clarinet, then we want to read with a little more strength, a little more resistance, gives us a bigger, warmer tone. Um, not being able to have high notes come out is a classic sign that your read may be too soft, that you're outgrowing it. If you get this kind of sound. You get that low growly sound. It means we don't have enough support. Now, certainly we can improve our air support and that will help, but support does come from the read. Um, there are times where we're literally in between two strengths. You know, we try the the one that we're on and the high notes don't quite come out. Maybe it's too soft. We go up half size and all of a sudden it, it feels fuzzy and hard to blow. So legitimately you can be between sizes. The good news is different read companies are slightly different from each other. So a three of this read might be like a two and three quarters, you know, of something else. And so you might be able to find another read that fits in between. But in the bigger picture, Julie, I'm not sure what you're playing on now. If you continue to work on playing with that faster air, um, if you're still at a stage where you're growing into reads, you'll probably find that stiffer read does start to feel natural for you. I'm not a proponent of going to a read that feels hard to play. I, I just don't think that's good. Um, so I think instead, just say, I'm going to work on developing my fast air. And then you might naturally outgrow the softer read. And at that point, the stiffer one might actually feel easier. So um, the other thing you can do is uh, I'm going to just very quickly um, draw a mouthpiece here. Okay. Here's my mouthpiece. And our read goes on the mouthpiece. If we put our reed so the reed's a little bit above the tip of the mouthpiece, it makes it act a little more resistant. You have some room to move it up and down. So if you're kind of between reed strengths, when you're on the softer one, move it up higher, you'll get a bit more strength. And that might be enough to make your softer reed work better. If you're going up to a higher strength, move it a bit lower. It still has to completely cover that hole when it vibrates, but it'll make it act as soft as it can. And that's sometimes a workaround to help you when you're in between sizes. Yeah. The um, things with reads are like really tricky because not just is like the size, like the number different, but like every read in the box will be different. And there's also something that I'm like sort of struggling with in my own playing right now is not being able to like quite put my finger on like what's the actual like strength of the read versus the response of the read, which are two very different things. Um, what I mean by that, the response is like pretty much how easy it feels to play. Um, so when you like blow and immediately you like release your tongue from the read, the note like comes out right away. That's a really responsive read. Whereas an unresponsive read won't won't come out right away. Um, and you pretty much never ever want to play on an unresponsive read. Um, the strength though is different because that has to do with uh, what Michelle was demonstrating with like the higher notes, how sometimes a too soft read will like close up when it's trying to play in the higher notes or when you're playing really loud, it'll close up. Or even when you're playing soft, if you're putting too much embouchure pressure, then it just like closes up and gets like a sort of thin, what I call like constipated sound. Um, so it's it's really a trick to find a read that's responsive and like the right strength uh and a lot of times it'll be really deceptive where you have a read that's like a little bit soft and may close up on you but it's not super responsive so it feels like it's holding up to like your your air blowing but it's actually like not the response that's there um same thing or actually like the the golden read would be like quite firm um and and strong and like really hold up to like a lot of uh strengthen the embouchure and like a lot of air pressure but be like super responsive so the notes come out right away uh i haven't figured out like a foolproof method to make reads like that or else i'd probably be very wealthy <laughs> um but i think that's sort of what like um legere and like the new silverstein uh synthetic reads are trying to like solve some of that problem too um yeah i think that's enough for reads for me. <laughs> okay, cool. And yeah, I'm just scanning through. There's some more questions here. Um, a few questions about the synthetic reads. Someone asked if we've tried the Silverstein. I haven't tried the Silverstein synthetic read yet. Um, I can't comment on it. I have two colleagues who tried it. Didn't work well for them. One who really liked it. So again, it's very different depending on your setup and what you have. 
Um, someone else had a question here about synthetic reeds. It was Carlos saying, I've just started to try them. They sound less warm, less full. How much effort needs to be put in to make it sound as well as a good wood reed? Would you recommend shifting? So again, this is personal preference. Um, so many professional players who I really like love and respect have been switching to it. You know, David Schifrin, who I think is just one of the most beautiful clarinet players in the world, plays on the Leger European cut reads. Ricardo Morales does, you know, Corrado Giuffredi, um, Jose, Franck, like, there's so many people who play on them. And what I, I was trying to go back and forth between Kane and, and synthetic, what I've realized is I actually have to play differently to make the synthetic reads have the warm sound that I'm accustomed to. And someone said to me, Michelle, you need to do it for a month. Don't touch your cane reads. And I tried it at the end of the month. I wasn't a hundred percent happy yet, but I pulled out my best cane read and it sounded awful. And I realized in that month I had been changing some things. I'm sure I could have made my cane read sound good again, but I thought, okay, I'm shifting. I'm going to stay with this. And after about six weeks, I went to um, a rehearsal with a trio I play with regularly who hadn't heard me play for six weeks. We'd been on a break and they were like, wow, Michelle, you sound like really good today. Have you been practicing a lot? And I was like, well, maybe, but I actually think it was that I had finally glommed into that sound and it was so nice to have one read and play it for a three hour rehearsal and it stayed the same the whole time. And so it does take getting used to it. I'm not even exactly sure what I've done differently but it took me a while to get used to it. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, if you're interested in it, for me, it was quite a shift in something. <laughs> yeah, that's what I found from my experience with playing on Legers as well, is that I will um, play on it and I'm like, oh yeah, this is a good read, like this works. And then I'll switch to a cane read and be like, oh, this is like so much better. Um, but I think that's because, again, like that's what I'm used to. And what I've heard, there have been a couple of like uh, colleagues that have switched that I know too. Um, and they did said exactly the same thing. Like you have to just play on like the plastic reads or whatever synthetic read you're using um, for like quite a while to like get used to it and figure it out. Um, and then it, it starts to make sense. Um, and for me, like, there's, yeah, there's all those professional players, and, like, my teacher, Steve Cohen, is, like, sounds, like, absolutely amazing and beautiful and, like, a really nice legato, and, and so I can't, like, complain about, like, the plastic read, but at the same time, I've had, like, studio classes where uh, other students were, like, trying to switch to plastic reads, and I could tell that they were playing on a plastic read, so it's sort of this, this, Thing that you have to like figure out how to make it work and I think it's just a matter of doing it over time. The one real benefit though of switching is that the reads are way more consistent. So a cane read will vary from day to day. So I think the real like positive is that your your plastic read will like stay much more consistent from day to day and it also doesn't like dry out if you're like switching or like have a lot of rests in a piece or something like that i think probably with the like advancing of synthetic reads i think at some point in the future many 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 clarinetists will be playing exclusively on synthetic reads um yeah yeah i think the the oh the one difference that i've sort of noticed is that the plastic reeds do take like a little bit less embouchure pressure especially like sort of right in the middle of your bottom lip so again if you might be like tend to bite on cane reeds then plastic reeds are going to be like a really bad time for you <laughs> yeah on the plus side is it, it will force you not to bite <laughs> if you want to sound good yeah um i found on the synthetic reeds at first it was a really hard to play my highest notes softly with good tone. It just felt less responsive. And I suspect that because I was a closet biter and I didn't know it. And on the synthetic reads, you, there's not much tendency for biting. So I really had to get my air working. And then maybe it's just that it helped me use my air better. You know, maybe if I took out my great normal read, I'd be sounding great. But I do think um, if you are serious about playing the synthetic reads, you have to go like try it with nothing else for a month or so and figure out what you need to do embouchure wise that's different but it really helped me master even better things with my air support and what josh said about it not changing with the weather i love i cannot tell you how much more freedom it gives me in my playing not to be messing around with reeds so yeah it, but it it's uh for about a month i struggled with it i really did i'm glad i stuck with it 
but uh, I picked a time when I didn't have any hugely important solo things to let myself have that adjustment time. And now I, I don't, not sure I'd want to go back. Yeah, it's interesting. All right, we are getting so many great, great questions here. And I, I we're going to try and answer as many as we can. Apologize if we don't get all of your questions. There are a lot of questions about intonation coming in. And, um, you know, some of them are really specific. Some of them aren't, but I think we should take a look at some of those. Kayala says, my middle B-flat on bass clarinet sounds so airy and sharp. Anyway, I can fix that. I know it's the register key that produces the airy sound, but I don't know how to fix it. Um, I think it's very similar to what we said earlier about the B-flat on the regular clarinet. Sometimes you need to add fingers to make certain notes play in tune. And every single bass clarinet is different, just like every single clarinet is different. Throat tones tend to be sharp on most clarinets, if I stereotype. Not true on all of them, but that's where adding some of the resonator fingers can help us on those notes. Um, if you have a note on your instrument that stands out, in other words, you're, you're playing a scale with the tuner and one note's way sharp or flat, sometimes you have a key that's out of adjustment. If, if there is a, a key that's opening too high, it'll make that note extra sharp and a, and a technician can just lower it a bit. Um, or if you push the key halfway and you still have good tone, so it's high enough to make good sound, but now you're in tune, that's a sign that key's too high. Or if it's not opening enough, it'll sound muffled and flat. So there are some things that can be done, you know, by a good technician to make anomalous notes stick out. But there are trends, you know, the throat tones tend to be sharp. Um, I don't know. If, I mean, when I played on buffet clarinets and most of my students who do, I find that the low end of the clarion tends to be a little sharp. It wasn't a big deal. Um, usually we tune with the barrel. Sometimes I would just pull a tiny bit in the middle joint and that took care of it. And then they worked great. So um, sometimes we just have to get to know our instrument and how to accommodate it. When we are first learning clarinet, we tend to be flat in the high register. And that's a combination of air not being fast enough and our voicing, our tongue being too low. That will fix itself over time as you work on air and other things. You just kind of have to trust that. Um, Josh, what about your thoughts? Do yeah, you the, the trick with the bass clarinet too, especially on that B flat, is because there's the two different register uh, holes that open when you press the register key, depending on how many fingers you have down, um, that can often like comes out of adjustment and is, is kind of tricky to keep that really well adjusted. So if when you're playing your B flat, if you notice that the um, both of the, the register pads are like opening even just a little bit, um, then it could definitely be something out of adjustment and it should just be like the one of them that's uh, opening up for, for the B flat. Um, the other thing too is that, oh, let me think. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I don't remember what I was gonna say. But yeah, it's just it's a matter of like figuring it out. And if you have like a note that yeah, is really out, then it may definitely be like an instrument repair thing or something that's that's worth looking at um, by a repair person. This is cool. So I'm just scanning over on Facebook, my friend who's an oboe player has joined us and she's probably thinking, Oh my gosh, these are clarinet geeks. We are <laughs> all of us who are here from all over the world. Thank you so much for being here. We've had um, Gosh, over 80 people signed in on Zoom. So we have a big worldwide audience here, which is fabulous. Um, someone else here was either Rich or Rika, I can't find it in front of me, said his low E is flat and wondering if he should get a different clarinet for that. Boy, that's a common tuning intonation tendency on clarinet. Has to do with, uh, anyway, it's, it's a design flaw. Um, a lot of the newer clarinets actually have a vent key that will open up when we're playing our low E and our low F to correct for that. Um, but unless you upgrade to one of those eight to $10,000 clarinets, most clarinets are gonna be flat on your low E. If you have a really prominent one coming up in a piece of music, sometimes I'll push my barrel in before I get there to make sure that note's in tune. Otherwise I will do, I'll bite. I'll bite the pitch up if, if it's just a matter of blending in and having it in tune. So uh, Josh, how about you? How do you handle that? Yeah, pretty much the same. It's like the, 
the, probably the worst thing about the clarinet intonation wise in my opinion is the fact that like the right hand clarion notes are sharp but then like those low notes are flat so yeah there's really not much you can do about it um it may be worth taking to a repair person because sometimes they can uh make small adjustments to the bell especially if it's just the e um oftentimes though the f is also very flat so yeah it's just a matter of doing whatever you can with your embouchure to like get it up. Um, that's something else too that sort of goes along with something that I really liked that Michelle said earlier with how every single note sort of has its own like optimal air pressure, embouchure pressure, air direction and like tongue position to it. Um, and I think just being able to like find that and being flexible to when you need to like do something to, to change it, like if you have the those low notes that need to really be high enough, um, having that flexibility to like place every note where you want it is like really the key to really having successful control of the instrument. All right, so um, Josh, I just happened to look at the clock. We've been going for an hour and 15 minutes and I had no idea so much time had passed, which is about <laughs> what I told people we would do. Um, so I'm having fun. I wanna balance answering questions. I feel like we should answer a few. Um, We'd also promise some door prizes. So I feel like we should offer up a door prize. And so um, I have a door prize. I have been noticing as a theme, in fact, I did a live training with a bunch of clarinetists earlier today, that rhythm is something that a lot of people have never really been taught how to do. We kind of figure it out. Um, and it's an area that a lot of people don't even know they have problems with but they kind of know that, wow, it's sometimes harder to learn a new piece of music or I have trouble sticking with other people. And it's one of those things that you can really improve quickly if you have a good system for learning it. So anyway, with that in mind, I've been working on creating a, a new rhythm course that I'm really excited about because it covers tons of stuff. It's about 90% finished. And so what I want to give as a Dora Prize is a 90% finished course, but you'll get the finished product when it's done. And I, I think it's useful right now. I actually have some keeners who are beta testers who've been doing it and leaving comments. So if you win the Dora Prize, if you notice anything that's missing or incomplete, let me know. And it'll be available to the rest of the world probably in a month or so. But it's called the Easy Rhythm Method. So here's how I'm going to do this. Get ready to type. Um, I'm going to give you a range of numbers and you're going to pick a number and you only get to pick once and whoever I happen to notice has it first. I don't care who has it first. I'm just going to see whichever one I notice. Whoever has that number first will win a free copy of the Easy Rhythm Method, which is about $150 value. Okay, so I am thinking of a number between 40 and 55. So, holy cow, that's going by fast. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So great. I love how everyone's on this. I actually don't see it yet. Oh, wait, I just saw it. John Honeycutt, 43. Da, 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 da. All right. John, thank you for that. And uh, gosh, I don't see anyone on Facebook putting that comment in other than Donna had one. Okay. So John Honeycutt, you are the winner of my easy ryth rhythm method course. So John, you can send me an email, michelle at clarinetmentors.com after after we're finished here and just give me your email address and I'll make sure to give you that. Um, by the way, if there's anyone else on this call who would like to have some ideas on rhythm and stuff like that, um, I want to make a special offer to you guys. The course is not available yet, as I said. Um, however, uh, if somebody would like to be one of my testers, I'm willing to give it to you as a special, just to those of you who are here. Um, just go to www.easyrhythmmethod.com and I have a special for you. It's going to be about two thirds of the price. I'm never gonna sell it for this cheap ever again. So for the next 24 hours or so, if you wanna do it, feel free. I'll type that into the chat box so you see it. That's just my way of supporting you who took the time to hang out with us for an hour and 15 minutes. Um, Josh, we do your door prize now or should we save it for the grand finale? <laughs> it's totally up to you. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, tell us about what you have. Yeah, so for for mine, um, I'm 
more or less like just getting started with this whole like online teaching thing, which I'm I'm really excited and really uh, grateful to Michelle for for doing this with me. And I, I'm I'm it was been a really great time. So thank you for that. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I have a how to play clarinet course, a how to play music course, and then a how to practice course. And I'm gonna put them all together in a bundle and uh, give it to whoever guesses the number right. Um, and yeah, it's basically these courses are sort of, I break down each of them into like fundamental categories. The clarinet one is air, embouchure, and tongue. Um, the music one is, there's a little bit of rhythm. I'm sure Michelle's rhythm course will be much more thorough, but rhythm, notes, and style. Uh, and then the how to practice course talks a little bit about like dividing up your practice time and things like that. Um, the one other thing in addition to the, the door prize that I want to let all of you watching know about and and to thank you is um just like a little secret about like how i have all of my stuff set up about how you can get like the best uh savings and like bonuses um if you decide to purchase any quick start clarinet courses and the best way to do that is to go to uh, www.quickstartclarinet.com and at the top you'll see like a little banner that uh, says to get your like free download of the three steps to mastering the clarinet and anybody can go there and get that for free um, by joining the uh, quick start clarinet community but go to that and then you'll land on a page to get the how to practice course for just five dollars which is a like special deal where you'll save money um, and then if you get that then you'll land on another page where you can get the whole bundle of everything for like uh like a hundred dollars in savings and with the how to practice course it's uh like something like a hundred and forty dollars off of pretty much everything from like what the normal prices would be so that's my little secret for for how to get the like absolute best prices on my website so if you go to quickstartclarinet.com click the the banner announcement at the top to get the free download of the three steps to mastering the clarinet and then you'll go from there awesome thank you so do you want to uh, give us a range of numbers? And sure, sure. Let's do um, 20 to 50. Hi. Okay. Start looking. Oh, boy, those numbers are flying by. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh, I saw it. Where'd it go? There it is. <laughs> <laughs> People watching. It looks like uh, Ramon. <clears throat> and the number was 27. Awesome. So yeah, again, go ahead and email quickstartclarinet at gmail.com um, and I will uh, get you with that, Ramon. Um, just let me know that you were the, the winner. Awesome. That sounds great. And thank you, those of you on Facebook who are doing your guesses. We're also keeping an eye on you guys. So really appreciate having you here from clarinets around the world. I think in the interest of time, we're just going to maybe answer two or three more questions and so appreciate having you all here. Um, I know we have people on this call who are relatively new to clarinet, people who are very experienced, but all of these questions, really we all have to, to go through. I feel like I've had every bad habit on clarinet possible, which probably helps me be a better teacher because I have empathy, but also makes me realize how much uh, we need to have those good habits. So a couple of questions that we haven't seen yet. There are, there are a few questions here, Josh, about when do we know to like upgrade to a different kind of clarinet? And do you have any mm. thoughts on that? I mean, it's kind of a big issue, but are you have some guidelines there? Yeah, I actually just recently um, bought a new clarinet myself. Um, and the reason for me why I felt like I needed to upgrade to a new clarinet was I was having a lot of issues with playing in tune on my current uh, clarinet. I tried different, many different uh, like mouthpieces and barrels and like no matter what I was just really 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 sharp. Um, so sort of a common thing that there's a lot of debate amongst the clarinet community uh, about is the idea of like clarinets getting like blown out um, and that after like seven to ten years of playing the inside of the bore like the dimensions actually change and it warps um, and it typically ends up getting like uh, wider um, over time of just using it and having like lots of air pressure and warm air like going through it um, and I had had my clarinet um, for about seven years and had been playing it like very extensively for that time um, and it the clarinet itself was made in 1976 so it was an older clarinet to begin with and I had put like many years playing it and it just wasn't feeling 
like quite as um, responsive and even as it was. Um, and the really big thing for me was I tried another clarinet that was um, newer and it just felt like so much better and felt so much easier to do what I wanted to do. So at that point I decided I should start looking for, for a clarinet. Um, the one thing too, just a general equipment thing, whenever you're trying equipment, it's um, the sound is very important, but almost the feel is more important. Um, you'll sort of, my philosophy is that you'll end up sounding about the same to on like pretty much any equipment. If you take a really great professional player and put them on like a student clarinet model, um, they'll probably sound pretty darn good. Um, but it'll be a lot harder for them to sound good on the, the, not as great equipment. So I think the key for equipment is finding something that makes it easy and something that you're comfortable to like get what you want on. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And again, I would say mouthpiece, first piece of gear, you know, have good reads. The, the barrel's fun to experiment with. As far as um, the whole instrument, Mike's asking a question about ergonomics of different brands. Um, the keys are set slightly differently on different brands. Yamaha will feel different from Buffet, will feel different from Bakun. Um, when I switched to my Bakun clarinet, I had programmed my finger pattern so deeply on my Buffet, my fingers were missing the holes on certain combinations. And it took me um, probably like six weeks to have most of it done. And, and honestly, a, a year or so before I really was fully there. But Again, what Josh says, what feels good, I think is really, really important. And you can adjust to a different fingering system on a different clarinet, but sometimes if you're upgrading, if you have a student Yamaha, you might, as you're trying different things, might really like the feel of a more advanced Yamaha because the fingering's the same or, or whatever. But I recommend you try all the different brands. Um, yeah, some are just gonna give you that better sound. It's, it does make the most difference in your tone quality when you're upgrading clarinets and how how evenly your sound goes from low to high. Um, intonation can be improved with a more sophisticated clarinet as well. Yeah, so there's some so many great questions in here. Um, there was one that was just so short and simple. I feel like we can answer. Oh, Kurt, do clarinets go sharp or flat as they warm up? Sharp, that's easy. Yeah, we blow yep, yep. hot air, they go sharp. So as you're in a rehearsal and you're warming up, you sometimes need to pull your barrel out to help bring your pitch back down again. All right, um, Josh, are there any questions you see that you feel a need to answer? And I'm sorry if we don't get to your answers, we're trying our best here, but... Um, there was one um, from YouTube um, that was, what would make the high B give me no sound? They've been, clar been playing clarinet for just about five months. Um, I think that's, well, first of all, which high B are you talking about? If it's the B above the staff, um, then that might be the reed being a little bit too soft. If it's the B in the middle of the staff, so the one um, just over the break with all the fingers down, um, that could very easily be just that you're not covering all the fingers all the way, or that you're... Um, just don't have quite the the embouchure strength and like air support built up yet um one thing if it is this b just over the break that uh i want to talk about and is that we, i saw a couple questions about crossing the break that we didn't get to the absolute best way to practice that isn't going from like a to b because that has like a ton of variables with how your fingers are moving um but it's actually to eliminate the variables of the fingers to just see if you can get those high notes out. So what I like to do is start on a low A, um, the one below the staff, play that with like a really good, clear, full sound, and then just add the register key to see if you can uh, overblow up to the 12th and get that out smooth. So that might sound something like this. So you have a smooth connection just by pressing the register key. Um, if you're getting something else, like maybe this, where the high note doesn't quite come out, then that probably means that your air isn't strong enough, your bottom lip is too squishy, or you're biting on the reed, so it's not able to vibrate at that higher energy level that it needs to on the higher notes. All right. And I want to add to that, um, I think if we're talking about that B that is, you know, right, right in the middle of the staff, um, a lot of times when we're first, first learning B, whichever pinky key we're using, our 
pinky, when it stretches, likes to pull our ring finger off. So whichever one, if it's this one over here, it tends to pull that finger off. I see that so commonly in beginners where the D works and then we try and put that key down and we don't realize that fingers come off the hole. So you can look in the mirror and see that, especially on the right hand, this hole is the biggest hole to cover at the bottom hole. And when our pinky stretches, we can pull that off. So watch for that. I just put a note in the chat box. I'll, I'll throw it in on the replay. I'm, I'm making a list of the resources Josh and I are talking about and we'll put a list in there. But also mechanically, if all your other notes work except that B, it's super common because these two keys come down together on a B. If they're a little out of adjustment, our B doesn't work. So if you're on Zoom, I just put in the chat box, check the mechanics of your B key, a YouTube video related to that. And one related to left hand position about crossing the break. So much of our challenges crossing the break is our left hand is moving way more than it needs to and it's not in good hand position. So for now, I'm going to give you a video just to, to refer to that. It'll give you more detail and I think it's helpful. If you go to the Clarinet Mentors YouTube channel and look up, you know, crossing the break, you'll find it as well. But that might be helpful. Um, wow, this has been a fabulous session. I, I just really appreciate all of you in the worldwide clarinet community that are joining Josh and I. And Josh, thank you for just coming on and sharing your knowledge with the world. It's yeah, totally of course. Cool. It's totally yeah. cool. And you have some really nice videos in your YouTube channel. So those of you who have not discovered Josh's videos, you know, check them out. Um, the more advice we have, the better we know, you know, how to improve our bad habits and make our clarinet playing more easily. So that's why we need our people like Josh in the world who just share their knowledge and have great knowledge to share. So yeah, thank thanks everyone. so much for having me. And thank you, everybody, for uh, listening to my uh, nerdy clarinet answers. Um, I really, like, obviously love playing the clarinet. So it's it's just been, like, a total joy to spend, like, the past uh, two, one and a half hours uh, just talking about all kinds of different uh, clarinet stuff with, with all of you. And, and thanks so much, Michelle, for having me. Yeah, thank you, everybody. So we will, if you're on Facebook, there'll be a replay almost instantly. For the rest of you, um, we'll send out an email link with the replay. I may not get all the notes in there for the next day or two, but we'll pop the video replay up almost right away for you. Thank you for all your questions. Those of you who sent them in ahead of time, thank you so much. And um, hopefully, by the way, one last thing, if you're not already a member of our communities, go to quickstartclarinet.com or learnclarinetnow.com, join the Clarinet Mentors community, then you'll hear about other things like this that happen in the future. All right, thanks so much, everybody. I'm gonna sign us off and uh, appreciate you being here. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you.